chapter 12, Truth Morphology. There is a certain amount of variation among individual teeth, and every tooth may not meet all the criteria for identification. By understanding the characteristics of able to differentiate among teeth, as well as between the left and the right teeth in a particular group. Clinical uses for tooth morphology, uh, mounting dental radiographs, now that um, x-rays are in black and white. So if you kind of sort of know the anatomy of each corresponding tooth, we'll be able to mount the radiographs just in case your x-rays got mixed up and you don't know which one is which by the, the shape and form of the teeth, sometimes also by the uh, number of roots of a tooth. You can be able to tell if it's from the top or the bottom, if it's from the left or the right. Assisting in charting a mouth with missing teeth and teeth that have drifted. Selecting temporary crowns or orthodontic bands from a box with a variety of shapes. And once you get into the field, you will be able to do this almost automatically. Just by looking at something, you'll know what where tooth it will fit and what tooth it belongs to. Forming matrix bands before application. So I don't know if you guys did a chapter with this yet, but a matrix band is a little aluminum aluminum band that is used for when um, you guys are doing a filling that um, it's interproximal, it's in between two teeth, and you lose um, the a part of a tooth that contacts with another tooth. So you use a matrix band to serve as the missing wall of the tooth. Um, fabricating temporary crowns and bridges. So anterior permanent teeth dentition. There are 12 anterior teeth in the permanent dentition, uh, six each in each dental arch. The permanent anterior teeth include the central incisors, the lateral incisors, and the canines. The central incisors are the closest to the midline. And remember we said the midline is the imaginary line that splits uh, your face like in half from right side to left side. The lateral incisors are the second teeth from the midline and the canines are the third teeth from the midline. All anterior teeth are succedaneous, replacing primary teeth of the same type. Succedaneous means that there was a baby tooth there and now it's going to rep it'll be replaced by an adult tooth, but it's gonna be the same exact tooth. So a central incisor a baby tooth is going to be replaced by a central incisor permanent tooth and a lateral incisor is going to be uh, be replaced by a lateral incisor. So that's what succedaneous means. Characteristics of permanent anterior teeth. So all anterior teeth have a cingulum, which is a rounded raised area on the cervical third of the lingual surface. So we said that the, the cervical third of a tooth is the, the third of a tooth that's closest to the gum. And of course, we said that the lingual surface is the surface that's towards the tongue. So if you roll your tongue behind your anterior teeth, you're going to feel that right by the gum line, there's like a little bulge, a little rounded raised area. But on the teeth that you mostly can feel that are on your canines. If you touch the back of the canines with your tongue, you're gonna feel that there's a, a, a protruded area there. It's like a bump. That's where you, that's what the cingulum is. The cingulum corresponds to the lingual development lobe. The lingual surface on anterior teeth has rounded raised borders on the mesial and distal surface is called marginal ridges. Some anterior teeth have a fossa, which is a wide shallow depression on the lingual surface. And that's what you feel with your tongue also. It's like an indentation and it's a uh, pretty flat. Permanent incisors. There are eight permanent incisors. There are four in the maxillary and there are four in the mandibular. The maxillary group comprises two central incisors and two lateral incisors, as does the mandibular group. These teeth complement each other in form and function. The central incisors erupt about a year or so before the lateral incisors. Maxillary, maxillary central incisors. 
the maxillary central incisors, which are eight and nine, have unique anatomical features, larger in all dimensions, especially mesial distally, which means that they're wide from the mesial to the distal. They're the widest teeth um, from the anterior teeth. Um, larger in all dimensions, especially mesial distally, than a permanent mandibular central incisor. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but your bottom centrals are much smaller. They're actually the smallest teeth in your mouth. Uh, labial surfaces are more rounded from the incisal aspect, with the tooth tapering toward the lingual root. To toward the lingual. The root is shorter compared with the roots of other permanent maxillary teeth. All lingual surfaces features, including the marginal ridges, ridges lingual fossa, and cingulum, are more prominent on the maxillary central incisors than on the mandibular central incisors. And if you touch your uh, bottom central incisors, you can tell you can kind of tell that they're pretty much flat. They're more flat than your upper central incisors. The incisal edges of these teeth are formed at the labial incisal line angle and do not exist until an edge has been created by wear. The incisal edge is also known as the incisal surface or incisal plane. And we said that incisal means the cutting edge. To incise means to cut into. When newly erupted, the central and lateral incisors have three mamelons or rounded enamel extensions on the incisal ridge or edge. So I don't know if you've ever um, seen small children when they get their first permanent teeth. Those teeth have little ridges. They have like little bumps on the edges and make them look kind of like a knife, kind of make them look serrated. Um, and the, the mamelons usually undergo attrition shortly after eruption. And attrition just means like normal wear. So as an adult, if you look at your adult teeth and you look at a child's teeth that have uh, when they're they have newly permanent erupted teeth, the adult teeth don't have that anymore because you've been using the teeth for a longer period. So those mamelons, they kind of like flatten out, like if you have filed them. Maxillary lateral incisors. Okay, the maxillary lateral incisors, which are number seven and number 10, are smaller than the central incisors in all dimensions except roof, root length. They usually erupt after the maxillary central incisors. The crown of a maxillary lateral incisor has a single root that is relatively smooth and straight, but may curve slightly distally. Recognizing this feature is helpful in the mounting of radiographs. The lateral incisors vary in form more than any other tooth in the mouth, except the third molars, and are often congenitally missing. Congenitally missing uh, laterals, and congenitally means that you were born without them and you'll never get them. Um, it's something common that you will see. Also, there's something called um, a peg lateral, which means that your lateral incisors look like a little triangle. Uh, basically like a peg. A peg is like, I don't know if you've ever seen um, like pirate movies where the pirate is missing part of their leg from like their knee down and they're wearing a wooden peg. That's what a peg is. So a peg lateral. Because of the variations in form, the permanent maxillary lateral incisors present challenges during preventative, restorative, and orthodontic procedures. Unattractive open contacts, which are spaces between the teeth, are called diastemas. Often occur in this area because of the variations in tooth size and position in the arch. Mandibular incisors. The permanent mandibular incisors are the smallest teeth of the, per of the permanent dentition and the most symmetric. The central and lateral incisors of the mandibular arch resemble each other. So your four, your four front teeth on the bottom, they pretty much look identical. They're all almost the same size and almost the same shape. Generally, the lateral incisor is larger than the central incisor in contrast to the teeth in the maxillary arch. 
super gingival tooth deposits such as plaque, calculus, and super gingival means above the gums. Uh, plaque, calculus, and stained tend to collect in the lingual concavity of the mandibular incisors. So this you will see a lot uh, in patients where they have a lot of plaque and a lot of calculus. And calculus is basically just hardened plaque. And it looks like a, like a layer, like a yellow or grayish layer, layer. And it's basically rock hard. Once that's on there, you can't take it off. Only the hygienist can take that off with a special machine. The mandibular central incisors, number 24 and 25, are the smallest and simplest teeth and are bilateral, bilaterally symmetric, and bilateral means like next to each other. Each has a small centered cingulum, subtle lingual fossa, and equally subtle marginal ridges. The crown of the mandibular central incisor is narrower on the lingual surface than on the labial surface. Developmental horizontal lines on anterior teeth are in, or imbrication lines and developmental depressions usually, usually not present or very faint. Okay, the mandibular lateral incisors, lateral meaning side to side, are number 23 and 26, are slightly larger than the mandibular central incisors, but otherwise similar to them. They mean, they're just a, a tiny bit wider than the centrals. The lateral teeth usually erupt after the mandibular central incisors. The lateral incisors have a small distally placed cingulum. Greater height of the cemental enamel junction or CEJ curvature on the mesial surface than on the distal surface helps distinguish the right mandibular lateral incisor from the left incisor. So permanent canines. The permanent canines are four anterior teeth located at the corner of each quadrant for each dental arch. And remember we said the canines are also known as the teeth that are the cornerstone of the mouth. Their name is derived from the Latin word for dog, canis, because these teeth resemble dog's teeth. And because I said that, remember, um, they're the long, they have the longest root, the, the third, the strongest teeth, and they, they're pointy, they kind of look like fangs. So that's why they call them canines. You will also hear patients refer to them as the eye tooth. Patients often complain of the normal, slightly deeper yellow color of their canines compared with their incisor teeth. So if you've ever noticed your teeth, your canines are a little bit more yellow than the rest of the teeth. And this is because the canines are bulkier teeth. So they have um, more dentin and the dentin is what gives the, their teeth the color. The more dentin, the yellower the teeth look. The permanent canines are the longest teeth in the dentition. The root is usually the length of the crown. This large root is externally manifested by the bony vertical ridge called canine eminence. Patients commonly call the canines their eye teeth. So maxillary canines. The maxillary canines, which are number six and number 11, usually erupt after the mandibular canines after the maxillary incisors and possibly after the maxillary premolars. The cusp tip is sharper on a maxillary canine. The mesial cusp slope is usually shorter than the distal cusp slope in both the maxillary and the mandibular canines when they first erupt. The length of these cusp slopes and the cusp tip can change with attrition. Mandibular canines are number 22 and 27 usually erupt before the maxillary canines and after most of the incisors have erupted. A mandibular canine closely resembles a maxillary canine. Although the entire tooth is usually as long, a mandibular canine is narrower labiolingually and mesiodistally than a maxillary canine. The lingual surface of the crown of the mandibular canine is smoother than that of the maxillary canines and has a less developed cingulum and two marginal ridges. Clinical considerations with canines. 
The maxillary canines may erupt labially or lingually in relation to the surrounded teeth, which means they can erupt further out than your rest of the teeth or further in than the rest of your teeth. The maxillary canines may also fail to erupt fully and may, re may remain impacted. Impacted means that the tooth is there, it just never erupted. It's inside the gum. It's inside the gums. Um, it's stuck in the bone somewhere. So when I was younger, I was about 12 or 13 years old, and my maxillary right canine still had not erupted. So I went to get my braces put on, and then that's when the dentist told me that my tooth, my canine was impacted. It was in the bone, and I had to have surgery uh, in order to bring the tooth down. So what they did was I went to an oral surgeon. They, op they opened, they made an incision um, in, in my gums, and they put a bracket in there inside the gums. They put a bracket on my canine, and then they tied that bracket with wires, and they tied it to the rest of my braces. So every month when I would go to my ortho, my ortho appointment, they would pull down the tooth little by little until finally my tooth was erupted completely. So thank God for ortho, because if I had never had braces and they had not done that procedure, I would be the age that I am today and I would be missing my maxillary right canine. Okay, and the cusp tip is sharper on a maxillary canine. Why oh, did I do this? Okay, so clinical considerations with canines. Like I said, the maxillary canine may also fail to erupt. That was my story about my um, impacted canine. This occurs because the permanent maxillary canines erupt after the maxillary incisors and possibly after the premolars and their arch spaces have closed. In my case, the space never closed. The space stayed there. It's just that the tooth was in the bone so it would never be able to come down on its own without the help of the braces okay so what is the term for the permanent teeth that replace primary teeth we said that the term is succedaneous is the term for permanent teeth that replace primary teeth okay and what is the correct term for the little uh, newly erupted central and lateral incisors that have the little ridges on the incisal edge? That's called mammalons. So posterior permanent dentition. The permanent posterior teeth include the premolars and the molars. The crown of each posterior tooth has an occlusal surface, which is the chewing surface, bordered distally and mesially by marginal ridges. The occlusal surfaces have two or more cusps. Imagine each cusp as a mountain with sloping areas or cusp ridges extending from the top of the mountain between the ridges or sloping areas called inclined cuspal planes. Each shallow, wide depression on the occlusal table is a fossa. One type of fossa on posterior teeth, the central fossa, is located where the cusp ridges converge into a central point where the grooves meet. Another type of fossa is the triangular fossa. Sometimes located in the deepest portions of the fossa are occlusal developmental pits. Each pit is a sharp pinpoint depression where two or more grooves meet. So if you... Uh, Take a look at your posterior teeth, especially your molars. You're going to see that the teeth have little ridges. They're like little lines. So everywhere where uh, two or more lines meet, those are called pits. And for kids, some parents decide to do um, sealants on those little pits and, and, and ridges because food can get stuck in there, especially because sometimes kids have very deep pits or ridges and food may get stuck in there and plaque gets stuck in there and they're not brushing their teeth correctly, that can develop into cavities inside those little pits and ridges. 
So by sealing them, it makes it a smooth area so that food doesn't stay stuck in there. Clinical considerations with posterior teeth. The occlusal surfaces on permanent posterior teeth have pit and groove patterns that make them susceptible to caries or decay, like I was just explaining. This occurs because of increased plaque retention and the thinness of the enamel forming the walls of the pits and grooves. The pits and grooves need to be carefully checked for decay with an explorer and mirror and possibly a chemical caries indicator. And a chemical caries indicator is like a little uh, solution that the dentist can put on the teeth and it'll tell you where there might be decay. Uh, dentists don't really do that anymore. That, I, I remember having that done when I was younger or when I first started working in dentistry, some dentists used to do that, but not, not so much anymore. Permanent premolars. There are eight premolars in the permanent dentition, two in each quadrant. They are located posterior to the canines and immediately anterior to the molars. So they're right after the canines, but before the molars. There are two types of premolars, the first and the second. A maxillary first premolar, which is number five and number 12, is larger than a maxillary second premolar. Each maxillary first premolar has two cusps, buccal and lingual, and two roots, facial and lingual. Both maxillary premolars erupt earlier than a mandibular premolar. The roots are shorter in length and resemble the roots of the molars. Clinical considerations for pre with premolars. The maxillary and mandibular premolars work with the molars in the chewing of food. The first premolars help the canines in shearing or cutting bits of food. The premolars also support the corners of the mouth and cheeks. So sometimes when people are missing either their canines or their premolars, you, with time, you can see that their cheeks start to get sucked in because those form the corner of the mouth. Also keep in mind that the first premolars, at least on the maxillary, they kind of resemble the canines, except they're, they're wider because they're chewing teeth, they're grinding teeth. But if you look at them from a sideways point of view, they kind of resemble a canine. Maxillary second premolars. Each maxillary second premolar, which is number four and number 13, has two cusps, a buccal and a lingual, and one root. So anytime there's a bunch of extractions done, you can tell which ones are the first premolars or the second premolars because of the root. The first premolars will have two roots and the second premolars will have one root. However, keep in mind that sometimes you will come across um, a patient that their second premolars might have two roots. It's rare, but it can happen. I've seen it. The differences between second and first maxillary premolars. The cusps are longer in length on the second premolar. The lingual cusp is slightly shorter, but not as short as the cusp on the maxillary first premolar. The mesial buccal cusp slope is shorter than the distal buccal cusp slope on the second premolar, and the cusps of the secondary premolar are not as sharp as those of the maxillary first premolar. Because remember, um, we said that the first premolar aids the canine, so that's why the cusps have to be um, sharper. The second premolar has only one root and one root canal, and the second premolar has a slight depression on the mesial root, the second premolar is wider, buccal lingually, which means from, from the facial, from the cheek side to the lingual side is wider. Mandibular first premolars, each mandibular first premolar, which is number 21 and number 28, 
has a long and well-formed buccal cusp and a small, non-functioning lingual cusp. The lingual cusp may be no larger than the cingulum on some maxillary canines. The mandibular first premolars are small and shorter than the mandibular second premolars. Mandibular sec second premolars, which are also number 29 and number 20, number 20 and number 29, erupt distal to the mandibular first premolars. And distal means toward behind. They are succedaneous replacements for the primary mandibular second molars, uh, which means that when there's a, a baby dentition, the second molars for that child is actually not going to be replaced by a permanent molar. It's going to be replaced by a premolar. There are two forms of the mandibular second premolar. There's a three cusp type or a tricuspidate form, and there's a two cusp type or a bicuspidate. And tri, of course, means three, bi means two. Permanent molars. So there are 12 molars, three in each quadrant. And we said there's four quadrants, so three times four is 12 in the permanent dentition. The molar crowns have four or five short blunt cusps and each molar has two or three roots that help support the large, the larger crown. Because remember we said these are the largest or I can say widest teeth in the mouth. So the name molar comes from the Latin word for grinding because that's exactly what the molars do. You don't bite into things with your molars. You don't cut into things with molars. You bite them with your with your incisors, with your centrals and your canine, and then you you push them with your tongue to the back of your mouth where the molars grind them. There are three types of molars. There's first, second, and third. The first and second molars are also called the six-year and 12-year molars. So the six-year molar, they the molar that you will have at six years old. And then your 12-year molars, usually erupt about the age of 12. Like my son is five, he will be six in November and all four of his first premolars are already erupting. I see, I see the bulge and I see the little cusps peeking already through his gums. Maxillary molars, usually the first permanent teeth to erupt into the maxillary arch. Each maxillary molar usually has four major cusps with two on the buccal portion of the occlusal table and two on the lingual, which means it has two cusps towards the tongue and two cusps towards the cheek. Each maxillary molar has three well-separated and well-developed roots. A tooth with three roots is said to be trifurcated, which means divided into thirds. Clinical considerations with maxillary molars. The roots of the maxillary molars may penetrate the maxillary sinus as a result of accidental trauma or during an extraction. The permanent maxillary third molars may fail to erupt and may remain impacted with the alveolar bone, which means that your, per, uh, your permanent maxillary third molars are your wisdom teeth. Some people never get wisdom teeth because they never erupt, okay? But they will always be third molars, even if they're not there. If the maxillary first molar is lost, the second molar can tip and drift into the open space, causing difficulty in chewing and furthering periodontal disease. Because if there is a space there, everything that you eat and chew is going to constantly be traumatizing your gums because it's just going straight into the gums and that can cause a, period, a periodontal problem. Periodontal meaning uh, something going on with the gums. Maxillary first molars which are number three and 14, are the first permanent teeth to erupt in the maxillary arch. Like I said, those are um, the six-year molars. They erupt distal to the primary maxillary second molars and are therefore non-succedaneous. They do not replace the primary teeth. Um, the maxillary first molar is the largest tooth in the maxillary arch and also has the largest crown in the permanent uh, in the permanent dentition. This molar is composed of five developmental lobes, two buccal and three lingual. The fifth cusp is called the cusp of Carabelli. And actually this tooth, um, I don't have that per se, but 
some people, when you put, put your tongue on the lingual side of your maxillary first molars, you're going to find that there's a tiny little cusp like on the side on the lingual. It's not on the occlusal side. It's actually like on the side of the tooth. And that's what's called the cusp of caravelli. Maxillary second molars. The crown of the maxillary second molar is somewhat shorter than that of the first molar. And it usually has four cusps. No fifth cups is present. There are three roots and the roots of the secondary molars are smaller than those of the first molars. So the lingual root is still the largest and longest. Maxillary third molars, which are number one and number 16, differ considerably in size and contour. The crown of the maxillary third molar is smaller and the roots are usually shorter. The roots of the maxillary third molar tend to fuse and the result is a single tapered root. People sometimes refer to the maxillary third molars as the wisdom teeth because they erupt last. Mandibular molars. So the mandibular molars erupt six months to one year before the corresponding permanent maxillary molars. The crown of the mandibular molars have four or five major cusps with two lingual cusps always of about the same width. All mandibular molars are wider mesiodistally than buccal lingually, which means that from the mesial to the distal, they are wider than they are um, from the lingual to the buccal. They're similar, similar to anterior teeth. Each mandibular molar has two well-developed roots, one mesial and one distal. A tooth with two roots is referred to as bifurcated, like I said before, which means divided into two. A bifurcation is the area at which the two roots divide. So if you guys look at the picture that I sent you guys today on the chat, um, the last two molars on that picture, the one that has the big cavity and then the last one on the picture, if you look at the bottom at the roots, okay, that's bifurcated. And that's the area which the two roots divide. And believe it or not, some people can get a cavity in that area in that little mid area, like the peak of where the two roots divide, some people can get cavities in that area. Clinical considerations with mandibular molars. The lingual inclination of the crowns of the mandibular molars can make it difficult to position the oral evacuator. And the oral evacuator is the HVE, the suction basically, what sucks all the water and the debris out of the patient's uh, mouth. The lingual inclination of the molar teeth can also pose pro problems in oral hygiene for patients who may miss the lingual gingiva with the toothbrush because it's hard to reach back there. It's also very hard to floss back there, especially if you have big hands and a small mouth. Mandibular first molars. The permanent mandibular first molars, which are 19 and 30, erupt between the ages six and seven uh, years of age. The teeth are commonly the first permanent teeth to erupt in the oral cavity. The two roots, mesial and distal, of a mandibular first molar are larger and more divergent than those of a second molar. The mandibular second molars, which are 18 and 31, erupt between the ages of 11 and 12 years of age. These teeth erupt distal to the permanent first molars. Distal means towards the back, further away from the midline and therefore are non-succedaneous, which means they do not replace any baby teeth. The crown of the mandibular second molar is slightly smaller than that of the first molar in all directions. The crown has four well-developed cusps. Mandibular third molars, which are also the wisdom teeth, okay, are known as number 17 and 32, are similar to the maxillary third molars in that they vary greatly in shape. There is no typical mandibular third molar. This molar is usually smaller in all dimensions than the second molar. The third molar consists of four developmental lobes. A mandibular third molar has two roots that are fused, irregularly curved and shorter than those of mandibular second molars. So now we're gonna talk about primary dentition. In primary dentition, we said that they're baby teeth. So there are 20 primary teeth, 10 in the maxillary arch, which means um, 
maxillary. Remember I said max is the top because if, when something reaches its max, it means that it can't go any higher. And then 10 in the mandibular arch, and mandibular arch meaning the bottom arch because that's where your mandible is. It includes incisors, canines, and molars. Numbered in the universal tooth numbering system with the capital letters A through T. So even though it's called the universal tooth numbering system, we only use numbers for permanent dentition. For baby teeth, we use A through T. Smaller overall and have wider enamel than the permanent teeth do. So I don't know if you guys have ever noticed, but baby teeth are so white. And once they start to get into the age of they where they have mixed dentition, which means that they're, they still have baby teeth, but they're also getting the permanent teeth, you're going to notice that the permanent teeth are much darker in color than the baby teeth. The crown of any primary tooth is short in relation to its total length. The crowns are narrower at the cemento enamel junction, which is also known as the CEJ. The pulp chambers and pulp horns in primary teeth are relatively large compared with those of the permanent teeth. There is a thick layer of dentin between the pulp chambers and the enamel, especially in the primary mandibular second molar. The enamel layer is relatively thin. Clinical considerations with primary teeth. So often parrots do not understand the importance of the primary teeth. Primary teeth hold the eruption space for permanent teeth which means if a baby tooth is lost too early in time, by the time that the, that the permanent tooth comes in, whatever permanent tooth is succeeding that baby tooth, you might not have a space there anymore for the permanent teeth to grow into. Hence, that's why they have um, space maintainers. I don't know if you guys have kids or have you ever seen a child with a space maintainer. A space maintainer is basically like a little silver crown that they put on one tooth, and then that silver crown has a wire that stays in between the in between the tooth that's missing and the other tooth in front of it. And basically what that does is that it does not let either the tooth in front of it uh, drift back or the tooth behind it drift forward. It holds the space for the permanent tooth, especially if the child is going to be without that tooth for a, a while, for, you know, for a couple of years probably. Because the enamel and dentin are thinner in primary teeth, decay can travel quickly through the enamel to the pulp, possibly causing a loss of a tooth. Early dental health education and dental care are essential in keeping the primary dentition. Primary incisors. The crowns and roots of the deciduous incisors are smaller than those of their permanent successors. The roots are twice as long as the crowns and taper toward the apex. Primary maxillary central incisors. The crown of the primary maxillary central incisor, which are E and F, is wider mesiodistally than incisocervically. It is the only tooth of either dentition with this crown dimension. The primary maxillary incisors have no mamelons. They're pretty flat. Their edges are pretty flat. The cingulum and marginal ridges are more prominent than they are on the permanent success successor and the lingual fossa is deeper. Primary maxillary lateral incisors. The crown of the primary maxillary lateral incisor, which are D and G, is similar to that of the central incisor, but much smaller in all dimensions. The incisal angles on the lateral incisor are also more rounded than on the central incisor. The lateral root is longer in proportion to its crown, and its apex is sharper. What did we say the apex was? The apex is um, the opening at the bottom of the root where the nerve travels through. Primary mandibular central incisors. The crown of the primary mandibular incisors, which are O and P, resembles the primary mandibular lateral incisor more than it does its permanent central successor. The mandibular central incisor is extremely symmetric. It is also not as constricted at the CEJ as is the primary maxillary incisor. The lingual surface of the mandibular central incisors appears smooth and tapers towards the prominent cingulum. 
primary mandibular lateral incisors. So the crown of the primary lateral incisors, which are Q and N, is similar in form to that of the central incisor in the same arch, but is wider and longer. The incisal edge of the mandibular lateral incisor slopes distally, and the distal incisal angle is more rounded. So the, um, the incisor slopes distally, which means that the edges that are distal on the tooth, which means that the edges that are furthest away from the midline, they kind of slope a little bit. So they're a little bit more rounded than the um, mesial edge. Primary canines. There are four primary canine teeth, two in each dental arch. They differ from the outline of their permanent successors in the following ways. The maxillary canine, the crown of the primary maxillary canine, which are C and H, has a relatively longer and sharper cusp than that of its permanent successor in eruption. The mesial and distal outlines of the primary maxillary canines are rounder. Primary mandibular canine, M and R, resembles the primary maxillary canine, but this tooth is much smaller labiolingually. The distal cusp slope is much longer than the mesial cusp slope. The lingual surface of the primary mandibular canine is marked by a shallow lingual fossa. The primary mandibular canine, which is M and R, resembles the primary maxillary canine, although some dimensions are different. This tooth is much smaller labial lingually. Primary molars. The primary dentition consists of a total of eight primary molars. Each quadrant includes a first primary molar and a second primary molar. Each molar's crown is wider than it is tall. The permanent premolars replace the primary molars when they are exfoliated. And exfoliated just means when they uh, fall out, and the new ones are about to come in. Primary maxillary first molars. The crown of the primary maxillary first molar, B and I, does not resemble any other crown of either dentition. The height of contour on the buccal surface is at the cervical third of the tooth. Remember we said the cervical third is the third of the tooth that's closest to the gums. On the lingual side, it is at the middle third. The primary maxillary molars have three roots which are thinner and have greater flare than those of the permanent maxillary first molar. Greater flare means that they kind of, uh, they're wider, they're more spread out. And the lingual root is the longest and most divergent. Primary maxillary second molars, the primary maxillary second molars, which are also A and J, is larger than the primary maxillary first molar. I mean, they closely resembles the permanent maxillary first molar, but is smaller in all dimensions. Because obviously, uh, baby teeth are not going to be as big as permanent teeth. The second molar usually has a cusp of carabelli, the minor fifth cup. And remember, we said that's the extra little cusp towards the lingual. Primary mandibular first molars, which are L and S, is unlike any other tooth of either dentition. The height of contour on the buccal surface is at the cervical third of the tooth. On the lingual side, it is at the middle third. It has four cusps. The mesial cusps are larger, has two roots, which are positioned similarly, similarly to those of other primary and permanent mandibular molars. Okay, and lastly, the mandibular second molars, which are the primary mandibular second molar, which are K and T, is larger than the primary mandibular first molar most closely resembles in form to the permanent mandibular first molar.